Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Barbara Munro and I'm chairing today's session. This is the fourth and final seminar in our series, Important Conversations. In the previous events, we've heard from a range of experts on issues surrounding DNA CPR, the inequalities people face at the end of life, and how coronavirus has changed the way we're approaching death in this country. Today, we'll be pulling together everything we've learned so far to try to create a roadmap for a different future for dying people and their families. Many of us are aware of the problems people are facing at the end of their lives. They don't always feel listened to when it comes to decisions about their end of life care. Blanket decisions are sometimes made for them by healthcare professionals without good communication or honesty. There are sometimes power imbalances between doctors and patients and worsening health inequalities. However, more and more people want to talk openly about dying with their families and with healthcare professionals, and they want to have conversations they've never had before. More people than ever want to plan ahead for their end of life care. Policy and practice is placing increasing importance on decisions being, made, being placed in the hands of patients with everything centered around what matters to that individual. This seminar is an attempt to look beyond the problems we've identified and to address what needs to change and to consider the solutions that might get us there. We'll hear from a panel of specialists with different perspectives on death and dying, including healthcare professionals, patients, family members, national policymakers, and healthcare leaders. This is an opportunity for our speakers to talk directly to policymakers and healthcare leaders about the changes they want to see for dying people. In brief, we're here today to ask, how can we seize the increased focus on death and dying to improve the experiences of dying people? How do we ensure that the increase in people planning ahead is celebrated, not feared. What must be done to make sure decisions are never again made in a blanket fashion and are instead based on the needs and priorities of each individual? Most importantly, we've asked all our panelists today, what's the one change that would make the biggest difference to people approaching the end of their life in this pandemic and beyond? It's great to see that over a thousand people, actually it's quite scary, but lovely to see that over a thousand people have signed up to attend this webinar. And what's even more impressive is that that is made up equally of members of the public and members of health and care professions, um, those organisations and the NHS. And we've also represented that balance on our panel of speakers today. So a few housekeeping rules first. Um, first of all, we'll hear from each of our expert panelists who are going to give a five minute lightning talk. And after that, when we've heard from all of them in turn, we'll open up into a discussion with the opportunity to answer your questions. Because we've got so many attendees today, uh, we won't be able to see or hear you, but I would encourage you um, to get involved by posing your questions. And please ask your questions by using the Q&A function, which might be at the bottom of your screen or it might be somewhere else um, if you're using a different kind of device. You can ask a question at any time and we'll endeavour to answer as many as possible. So when asking your question, please try to be brief um, so that we can squash in as many responses as we can. Um, and if you feel comfortable, if you let us know your name and um, why talking about this is important to you. We disabled the chat function due to the number of attendees, but the Compassion in Dying team may post uh, some things there for you to see. And finally, um, if you'd like to share your thoughts on social media, um, either during the webinar or afterwards, please use the hashtag important conversations. So enough, let's go now um, to our first speaker. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Liz O'Reardon, who's a breast surgeon with breast cancer 
who will talk about how clinicians should celebrate, not fear, people planning ahead. Over to you, Liz, thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, since I retired as a surgeon, I now spend one day a week reviewing the deaths of people in the local hospital. And it's given me a lot to think about, both as a doctor and a patient. And we now live in a world where almost 2,000 people dying a day is seen as normal. I think death and dying are at the forefront of people's minds. And I wonder, is now the time to make a change? I want to ask each of you listening today, how many of you have thought about where you want to die? I've asked doctors and nurses this all over the UK and almost nobody wants to die in a hospital, but one in two of us are going to. Have you thought about what you would want when you knew you were close to dying? What the last thing you'd like to hear is, the last thing you'd want to eat? I'm gonna go step, one step further and ask, how many of you have an advanced care plan? I'm embarrassed to say I don't, despite talking about it on this seminar. And I think as a cancer patient, realizing that I might die before I thought I would is a really scary thing to take hold of. And it makes it seem quite real. And it took time, almost two or three years since my first diagnosis to be able to actually think, what do I want when I die? But I haven't done my advanced care plan yet. And I'm still not sure why that is. I became a step granny again recently. Uh, my stepdaughter had a baby boy. and it's amazing the difference between birth and death because pregnant mums are surrounded by videos, classes, magazines, courses to help them plan the perfect birth for this new baby coming into the world. And that's part of their care record. They work with their GPs, their midwives, their consultants. They know what to take with them. They know what they want. And if something changes clinically, the situation plan changes with their consent. But where's that for dying? It's the one thing that's going to happen to all of us, but we don't watch videos of what a good natural death can look like. We don't have a bag packed of things to take in with us. We just don't talk about it. And I think things have to change. As a doctor, it can be incredibly hard to tell someone they're dying. And often it's easier not to tell them and wait for patients to slowly slip into a coma so we don't need to have that difficult conversation. A lot of doctors are very good at telling the family, but often again, we use metaphors. They're gravely ill. There's a chance they might not make it, make it, but unless you use specific words, it doesn't sink in. It's like 20 years ago, I would never tell a patient they had cancer. It was a tumor or a lump or a neoplasm because you couldn't say the big C. It's the same with dying. We need to borrow Catherine Mannix words who says, just tell patients they're sick enough to die. It doesn't mean they're going to die, but everybody understands what might happen. Hospitals need to become a place where you can have an excellent death and that needs to be championed. I think another problem is education because CPR in hospitals rarely works. It's messy, it's undignified. And if you're one of the lucky couple of percent to survive CPR, most people don't leave ITU or have a very poor quality of life afterwards. And I think we need to help the public understand that not resuscitating someone is not the same as providing excellent care when they're dying. I've seen a lot of notes where doctors have made the interests, made a decision in the best interest of the patients. They're very old, they're very frail. I don't want to put them through CPR, but they don't tell the patient they've done that. And I've seen cases where family realize an order was made after the patient had died and they didn't know. And it's wrong. This isn't something that a healthcare professional should do to a patient. It should be a decision involving them. Advanced care planning is all about enabling individuals. It's not doctors telling them what to happen. And I think doctors and nurses need to realize that patients may want different things to you and learn how to put your own prejudices and biases aside to give patients what they want. And if you can't have that conversation, then do you need training in how to help them understand what all the different options are? Everybody should have an advanced care plan and it should be part of their hospital care record, their GP records. If you're too ill to talk or explain what you want, everybody knows. That is what I live for. The one change I would love to see as a result of this pandemic is to live in a society where talking about death and dying is normal. Like we talk about sex, childbirth, and what to buy in the supermarket on a Friday night where people are encouraged to think through what they really want to happen when they near their end of their life. And clinicians feel supported to help them make those plans and have those conversations. After all, it really is the only certainty in life. Thank you. 
Thank you very much indeed, Liz. Uh, that was challenging to all of us, um, but it was a very honest personal testimony too. Um, and that powerful message about enabling individuals. I'd like to introduce now uh, Sonia Brown, whose husband Alan died of cancer during the pandemic. Um, she's going to talk about how a lack of honesty and good communication affects people's end of life experiences. Sonia. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today uh, and also to tell Alan's story. I live in Lanarkshire in Scotland and was married to Alan for almost 29 years. Alan was diagnosed on the 14th of October 2019 with stage four lung cancer and he passed away at home on the 11th of April in the midst of very, very first lockdown. So very early days. In the six months, it's such a short time between Alan's diagnosis and his loss, we were never told that he, his condition was terminal. At the very onset of oncology appointments, seeing his respiratory consultant, we were never ever told those words that it was terminal. We were told stage four lung cancer with a kind of expectation that we knew what stage four lung cancer meant. This was our first experience of dealing with anyone with cancer. So we were absolutely in the dark. I remember very clearly after Alan's very first consultation with his oncologist. And I remember very clearly he said to the oncologist, I'm relieved because I thought I was coming in here today for you to tell me to get my affairs in order. No one challenged that. So Alan was under the assumption that, you know, with chemotherapy, which he undertook, you know, he could come out the other side of this. After Alan had passed away, I raised this issue as to why we were never, the words terminal or, you know, life limiting were never used to us. And the response from the hospital was that the, the consultant, I can't say if it's all consultants, didn't tell patients they were terminal unless they specifically asked. Now, for a lay person, how, how do we know what questions we're supposed to ask? We rely on doctors, consultants, healthcare professionals to guide us. We rely on their expertise. And that didn't come across at all. So Alan, on the assumption that this was not a terminal diagnosis, underwent grueling chemotherapy. And he had four main sessions with scans after each second uh, session that showed that the cancer wasn't spreading, which was great news. However, after the first a chemotherapy session, he suffered a saddle pulmonary embolism that was absolutely massive. And he spent his 62nd birthday, and what actually now was his last birthday, in hospital with that. I know I was married to him for a long, long time. And I know that if Alan had known this condition was terminal, he would never have put himself through chemotherapy. Alan would have lived his life on his terms and, and chose to end his, his life the way his life, the way he wanted. So the, the story progressed slightly on, on the 28th of March. Uh, again, this was only, I think, three days after the first national lockdown for COVID-19. Alan was hospitalised for suspected COVID-19. So this was the very start. We we weren't allowed to visit, so it was very much a case of the paramedics took him away, took him to hospital, and I couldn't see him. No one was allowed to visit, so my only kind of contact with the hospital was through phone calls. And every phone call would be, yes, Mrs Brown, he's doing fine. You know, he doesn't have COVID-19, he's got a chest infection. So, you know, that was good news. So on the 1st of April, I got a phone call from the Macmillan nurse in the ward. And she had told me that they now believed Alan was in the terminal phase of his illness. Now, terminal was the first, this was the first time we'd heard that word. Uh, so obviously, you know, it was done as a phone call because of the situation. I had no one here for support. It was a phone call and trying to come to terms with that was, you know, was very, very difficult. But anyway, they told me that he wanted to come home. So he was discharged to my care on the 3rd of April. Uh, and was discharged with oxygen, a hospital bed, and district nurses 
coming in once a day to change medications in the syringe driver. Still, I would ask every day, does he have long? I would ask all these people trailing in and out the house. Nobody would tell me. Nobody would say to me, I know it's maybe something that people can't approximate, but there must be signs that you can tell someone is dying. I wasn't told them. And no one would tell me. We still went through this whole situation with no one telling me. During one of the nurses' visits today, or, or when, they were, when he, they were here, they'd left a folder on nursing notes on the sofa. So I had a look in, you know, this folder. And this folder contained a document called a DNR. And in behind it was another piece of paper allowing nurses to certify Alan's death. Now, I never knew that document was there. Never knew that document was there. It hadn't been discussed. The hospital certainly hadn't told us. Alan at that time wouldn't have been capable of knowing what he was signing. Uh, and we, the, I, when I saw it, I didn't do anything about it. I looked at it and I thought, oh, what's this? What do I do? And I closed the folder. And I never even discussed it with our sons. Our sons only found out about this after their dad had passed away. So I didn't know what to do with it. Uh, but it was there. It was there. And I now know with Compassion and Diane's help that that would have been the right decision for Alan. Putting him through a do not resuscitate or attempt CPR would have been very wrong for him. But I didn't know that until I'd spoken to them. And I initially thought by not responding or challenging this document, how had I allowed Alan to die? So I didn't know. Uh, Alan, as I've said, passed away on the 11th of April. We, uh, we were, his breathing got strange, is all the way I could describe it, and it was different from it being. So I had phoned the district nurses and said, his breathing is, is different. Uh, what do I do? And they told me just to hold his hand and talk to him. No one came out. They arrived 40 minutes later after he passed away. I didn't know he was taking his last breaths. No one had, we weren't prepared. No one had taught, told us, no one had told us what to expect. We were on our own. Uh, what I would like in an ideal world to come out of this is honesty, proper communication, because it robbed Alan and his family of the right to plan how he wanted to live with his diagnosis. And it also robbed us of the ability to plan how he died. We had no support. I lived with the guilt of that, do not resuscitate for some time. And as I've said, I initially thought by not speaking up, I'd allowed him to die. I'm aware that COVID-19 restrictions impacted in that too. And had I been able to visit Alan in hospital, I could have asked the right questions, been prepared and made an informed decision. But obviously that, that didn't happen. Thank you. And sorry, I've, I've gone over my time. Sonia, thank you very, very much indeed. I can't think of a more powerful statement about the need for preparation and for honest communication. Um, thank you very much indeed. I'd now like to ask Usha Grieve, who's the Director of Partnerships and Services at Compassion in Dying. She's going to talk to us about what she's been hearing over the course of the pandemic from dying people and their families. Usha. Thank you. Um, before I look forward, um, I just want to take a moment to consider the title of this series of webinars, Important Conversations. So it, it's a phrase that we included in a report that we published two years ago called I Wish I Had Known. And in this report, we cautioned against labelling conversations on dying as difficult because we'd seen how this can actually put people off engaging with the subject. Now, at the time, it really struck a chord. And the pandemic, I think, has even further validated this theory. So these, con these conversations aren't luxury add-ons to good end-of-life care. They're actually the foundation. And we've seen recently that failure to have conversations in advance of a sudden decline has forced clinicians to make decisions in moments of crisis and has meant that they haven't always been able to communicate with people as sensitively as needed. But then on the other side of the coin, we've seen that the pandemic has actually prompted more people to think about and talk about their end of life. So during the first lockdown, calls to Compassion in Dying's information line increased by 
and the number of people making advanced decisions to refuse treatment rose 160 percent so now looking forward as this event is all about solutions um here are three that i think are needed to ensure people have a good death Firstly, we need to make sure everyone is able to plan and make decisions about their treatment if they want to. So the pandemic has clearly made existing inequalities at the end of life worse. Now we have an advanced care planning service in Lumber, which works with various local communities at risk of health inequalities. And demand for this service has plummeted since March. But as I said earlier, demand for our phone based support, which is mainly used by white people with low support needs has massively increased. Now, the specific communities that we're working with in Lambeth don't need support to plan their end of life care any less than the people phoning us do, but rather because we've not been able to offer face to face tailored support, we just can't meet those groups needs and they have therefore been disproportionately affected. So we need to really build networks, um, build relationships with trusted networks within communities, make sure we're listening to people and can be reactive to their needs and we need to be speaking about these topics in a language, and I mean that both literally and metaphorically, um, in a language that resonates. And I think there's actually a broader point here to uh, um, about respecting differences. So a good death for one person might actually be a bad death for somebody else. And advanced care planning is so important because it allows us to translate our values into treatment decisions. So nobody should feel stigmatised for what they do or don't want at the end of life. But sadly, we still hear stories of some clinicians reacting negatively to people's decisions. So secondly, in terms of solutions, we can't accept simplistic narratives. So as we all know, do not resuscitate decisions have been given a lot of coverage recently, and such unlawful decisions have affected the people that we support. So we know it's an important story to tell, but too often in the media, there's been a singular narrative only highlighting the negative impact of bad CPR decision making on vulnerable people. And, and do not resuscitate decisions and advanced care planning are nearly always being portrayed as harmful. And we, we actually know that advanced care planning can make the difference to a person having a good experience at the end of life. And the pandemic has made a lot of people want to know how to plan ahead. So by not giving these people a voice too, I think there's a real danger that DNA CPRs and advanced care planning become tools that the public fear or um, something that doctors are scared to broach for fear of accusations of giving up on their patients. Now the repercussions of this in terms of people's wishes being known and respected would be huge. We've actually at Compassion in Dying convened a roundtable recently to discuss how we can change this narrative and it's on us really as professionals to be proactive and bold and show positive, positive examples of um, the impact of good end of life decision making. And I, I think this will have a massive impact on how we approach dying as a society. And it will also help to ensure a medical culture where good, sensitive conversations are had. So thirdly, finally, we need to improve our recording systems. So at Compassion in Dying, we've known for a long time that whether or not somebody receives treatment in line with their wishes often relies on a family member being present with the right piece of paper. Now this has been compounded by the fact that due to COVID you can't have someone by your side in hospital to advocate for you and that I think is um, even more significant for people who find it hard to fight their own their own corner for whatever reason. So end of life records must therefore be accessible and shared seamlessly between care settings and across geographical boundaries. I think this system also needs to allow people themselves to record and amend their wishes and preferences. And these things are nice to have, they're fundamental. I'm, and I'm really happy to say that we're working with NHS England who are leading a great piece of work looking at these very issues. And for the people we support, these changes, they just can't come soon enough. So in summary, I think we need to get to a place where people see themselves as the leaders in decisions about their care. And importantly, they're recognised by healthcare professionals as such. Because despite there, there being so much policy, which asserts just that, we're just not there in practice yet. So to finish, I want to quote somebody that I spoke to on our information line recently, who said, I'm the one who's dying. I wish somebody would just acknowledge that I might know what's best for me. 
Thank you, Usha, um, and thank you for ending on that very powerful quote. Um, you've reminded us about the importance of joined up records and as all, all parts of the system being able to talk to one another, um, but also about those who find our services more difficult to access, um, not making assumptions and keeping respect. I'd like to introduce now Peter Hallgarten, who was featured in BBC Two's hospital documentary series when he was hospitalised with coronavirus. Peter's going to share with us how he discussed and documented his end of life wishes. Peter. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Barbara. And thank you for asking me to join today's webinar. To put my words in perspective, perhaps a short bio, I'm 89, I've been married for over 60 years. We have three children and six grandchildren. I trained as a chemist, but began working in the family wine business when I was 29, and I finally retired last April. I've lived for the last 50 years in Camden, just down the hill from the Royal Free Hospital. <clears throat> I've been interested in dying well for about 10 years, when the subject was first raised in the patient's group of my GP surgery. The discussions were not comfortable for all the members of the group for obvious reasons. Eventually, it was agreed that the surgery's partners should consider and present the topic to all patients. So Compassion in Dying now has a place on our surgery website. My wife and I both registered our living wills with our GP surgery and told our children we would refuse certain treatments, especially resuscitation DNR. Having seen friends and acquaintances dying in different and not always pleasant circumstances, it gave us comfort that in our turn, if we became seriously ill or unable to communicate, we would die without any medical intervention to unnecessarily prolong our lives. Much last year, before I contracted COVID-19, my wife and I discussed our reaction to falling in ill and the possibility of needing ventilation. We agreed that we would not want resuscitation or ventilation. When you are very unwell and unlike, unlikely to make a good recovery, we agreed that the target should not be staying alive, but to have a quality of life, to make the effort of doctors and medication meaningful for everyone. My, my own experience put this to the test. I contracted COVID-19 after a dinner party where one of our guests was unknowingly infected. Cough and fever followed. I made several calls <clears throat> to 111 and my daughter alerted my GP who then kept in touch. After a few days, he realized from my voice that I was becoming really unwell. He suggested I go to the Royal Free for an assessment. A&E was empty. My assessment was almost immediate. The doctor noted that my GP's letter, which they emailed to me to take with me to the A&E, stated that I had an updated DNR in place. At the assessment, the only comment made was that I was not very good. And I think I read between the lines what that meant. Whilst waiting to be x-rayed, I was approached and I was asked if I was willing to have a chat about my visit and have my picture taken. I agreed and later found that I had signed on for the filming of Hospital Special, special for BBC Two, which duly appeared last May. Once in the ward, the consultant who interviewed me made it clear that I was confirming my DNR wishes. I was only to be given oxygen and medication for my pneumonia definitely no ventilation or any other intervention. The doctors also spoke to my family to confirm that I would not be ventilated if the oxygen treatment was not successful and to confirm that they were fully aware of my decision regarding DNR. I felt that my family would certainly be happier if I died calmly and comfortably. I returned home after 12 days of absolutely wonderful care in the Royal Free and have been very fortunate to avoid long COVID. After my experience, I was and still am absolutely certain that my DNR decision was totally clear and defined. 
my DNR stays in place for the future so that the target of quality of life is my only defining factor when planning for the future or for my final days. My family knowing that having a DNR in place may go some way to ensure that I will not be given any treatment that would prolong any suffering in the event of significant illness. They know that I do not want to extend life beyond the point where I'm able to get some satisfaction from life and they respect that decision. Finally, I would encourage everyone to have these discussions with their family when they are well and before a crisis arises. My family told me that it's a comfort knowing that I've thought about these issues thoroughly, made my own decisions with their understanding, that I will not leave them with the worries of second guessing what I would want in the event that I became very sick. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And um, <clears throat> I think that that really illustrates very powerfully the peace of mind it can bring both to the individual, but also to families and healthcare professionals when someone has thought ahead about their wishes at, at the end of life. Thank you very much. I'd like, now like to introduce Samira Ben Omar. She's the Assistant Director of Equalities for the Northwest London Collaboration of CCGs and co-founder of Community Voices, Voices for Change. She's going to talk to us about how coronavirus has exacerbated health inequalities and what solutions need to be in place to overcome this. Samira, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this session and thank you for uh, being so generous and giving me this platform to actually share some of the work that we're doing. But before I start, I really wanted to share with you Amina's story. So Amina's uh, parent, and she has uh, um, asked me to share her story and has given me permission to share her story. Amira, Amina's parents uh, both uh, sadly passed away last week, uh, both passed away of COVID. Uh, 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 her mother passed away on Sunday and her father passed away on, uh, on Wednesday last week. Her brother is on, uh, uh, in ICU and is at end of life care. Uh, at the moment so it's um uh, and uh, she has been so incredibly generous with uh wanting to actually share uh, some of the perspective of what really mattered at the end of life particularly for somebody uh, uh from a, a particular background around around how they experienced their end of life so um she just uh, given me some examples she said just in terms of what really uh just kind of to show the compassion at end of life main thing for her for, for her mother was the fact that the nurse was able to actually give her a scarf to put on her head every time she spoke to the um to her family on a video call what was frustrating is that the video call will, will only allow three to four people at a time you know she's got uh, their six sisters and uh, uh, and a bigger family so how can you actually uh, be able to do that without actually having um, uh, uh, access to, to talking to the family as a whole the second bit um, was very much around her her experience in just uh, at the very end of her life she wanted to it's very um, it's a muslim thing where uh, your last rites uh, you have the quran read out to you so um, she had a nurse who was kind enough to be able to allow her to do that and to actually kind of have that during that space. But as the as as shifts as people came in from different shifts, there were complaints about music being played. Uh, so there was kind of a real lack of understanding about what was going on. And as her mum passed away on Sunday, she said the kind of very basic things that she really needed. Um, you know, in Islam, it's uh, a member of the family who will wash you, or who will wash you. So she did the, the ritual and she said just very basic things, a hairbrush uh, to brush her mother's hair. You know, that wasn't, that wasn't around. Her mother's hair was knotted. Uh, nail clippers, a shroud that's long enough to cover her, her ankles and uh, a small pillow for her mother to uh, rest her head. Um, and that's just so she used the scarf to actually kind of uh, for, for her mother. There's just something very basic about actually kind of very basic, uh, uh, you know, nail clippers, a hairbrush seem very basic, but those are the very makeup of what compassionate conversation that you can have uh, with a person at their end of life and also with their family. Um, now, I just want to take you, I wanted to share that with you. It just goes the 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 
the power of a conversation and who's having the conversation to actually kind of really demonstrate uh, 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 the outcome that uh, people want. Very final thing, just actually um, in a lot of the uh, faiths, you know, in the Jewish faith, in the Muslim faith, and a lot of other faiths, you need to bury your dead very, very quickly. So the fact that only a death certificate can only uh, be uh, 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 given between Monday and Friday, that gives a real challenge. Um, now, I want to take you to Community Voices and while we started Community Voices very, very quickly. Community Voices was born out of frustration. Um, and it was very much at the early stages of COVID and the impact on a lot of our Black, Asian, and minority ethnic groups. Um, I, I have Sharon. Sharon is a community organizer and she's kind of very, very active in her African Caribbean community. And when I asked her to describe, and she said, the, word, the one word I would give you is fear. Now, there's a disconnect between our system and our communities. So when it comes to going to hospital and the fear that if you go to hospital, you die, People would rather actually kind of stay at home, being unwell, rather than go in hospital and die. So there's a real disconnect between uh, us and our system. So we only actually kind of connect when there's a disaster. The very same thing happens. I'm in a part of London that actually has Grenfell. So I was, when Grenfell fire happened, I was kind of part of that. It's just then what do we do? How do we actually have the conversation? So there's something about what do we do before things like this happen and how do we actually kind of manage that? So, I, I mean, for me, just in terms of what is the call of action, these stories are not there as a voyeuristic way to actually kind of tell somebody's, if you like, extremely traumatic and sad experiences. These need to mobilize into actions in what we can have as matter of fact rather than actually just uh, uh, something that we need to actually kind of think about how we embed on top of. Because the minute we start talking about on top of, automatically assumes the inequality that exists in our system. Second is how do we listen to truly understand? We're listening, we're participating. And who sets those questions? You know, who sets the question about what end of life care is? How, how are we making assumptions about what that involves and that what, what that includes? Uh, and the final bit is just about actually kind of the, the, the nature of the conversation that we have. Sometimes we are talking, but sometimes a lot of these conversations tend to be almost like a performance where we have these conversations where we ask a question, we expect a, a particular answer, and we actually kind of forget the power of people's stories and people's lives that exist outside of our system and our settings. So there's something about actually kind of how we have different types of conversations with our communities to really transform the system, not to actually kind of use it as a way of just seeing it as one-off story. Uh, I'm a real believer in actually kind of thinking that there is the quantitative data, the experiences that we get, the surveys are brilliant. We need those for things, but they're never going to tell you, you know, uh, the very questions we asked when COVID started is how are you coping? How are you feeling? If there's one thing I can do for you, what is it? And that generated a whole, uh, uh, took us a through a completely different route that rather than the route of, you know, I want more information. I want, because it wasn't for lack of information. It was the fear. And the antidote to fear is not information, it's compassion. I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samira. Yeah, really listening to people's stories and understanding what they as an individual want, but also uh, something there in the story of Amina um, about uh, that communication isn't just words, it's also acts. Um, and the nurse and the scarf, a really powerful example of, of how to get things better closer to what people want. Um, I'd now like to introduce Rosie Bennyworth, who's the Chief Inspector of Primary Medical Services and Integrated Care at the CQC. Rosie is going to discuss emerging themes from their current review of DNA CPR decision making during the pandemic. Rosie, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon and talk about the work we're doing on the Do Not Attempt Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation Review, which I will shorten to DNA CPR. Um, uh, sorry about the, the, the jargon, but uh, um, hopefully um, it, will, it will make sense. So um, we uh, at the CQC, the CQC is the regulator for all health and care settings across um, across England. And during the first wave of the pandemic, we became aware 
quite early on about the blanket use of DNA CPR um, decisions. Um, so we heard about care homes uh, being receiving letters uh, from their GP saying everyone in the care home needs to have a DNA CPR order. We heard about some stories in some of the learning disability homes. Um, and we had some fairly, um, fairly uh, shocking and uh, truly unacceptable um, things that were fed through to us. Uh, we took immediate action, action and sent out messages to the, uh, to the providers we work with saying that this is unacceptable and under no circumstances, um, blanket approaches should be used um, and people should have those um, personalised discussions, they should have those discussions with individuals um, and those decisions should be made uh, between the person and the clinician and, um, and made uh, or, or their representatives. Um, we want to make sure DNA CPR has a really important role to play in good end of life care um, as part of advanced care planning. And we absolutely want to make sure that that happens. And just picking up on Usha's um, point earlier, we don't want it to be seen as something negative or something that doesn't happen. It is really important that we get the messages around this right. And the review we've been undertaking has been very much focused on how we pick up the good things and how we pick up the, the best practice as well as picking up the learning so that we can make sure that everyone working in health and care improves and this situation improves across the country. The other thing we were picking up over the summer last year is that actually in some cases people were using a DNA CPR um, decision uh, to restrict people from having other care, such as uh, being admitted to hospital, which again is clearly unacceptable. Um, uh, people need to have those discussions about what other care they want and what other treatment they want, and that needs to be part of advanced care planning. And a DNA CPR decision is just part of that wider discussion um, and needs to be done in, in that context. So we were commissioned by the Department of Health and Social Care in October to undertake a review um, to understand what had happened during the first wave of the pandemic. And uh, we worked with lots and lots of different organisations and lots of people using services um, during the first part of that review. And we published an interim report in November. The final review will be published in March um, and we will be able to share that with uh, uh, widely and those messages and I'm keen that we get some really clear recommendations that drive um, improvements for everyone using health and care services um, and really make sure that we use this as an opportunity to, to change the situation we find ourselves in at the moment. So just to touch on the, the interim findings in, as part of our early review, um, we heard time and time again, there was quite a lot of confusion. There was quite a lot of miscommunication in the first part of the, the, the pandemic, um, particularly in March and April, um, a sense that people providing health and care felt very overwhelmed by all of the guidance that came out. Um, and that led to some of the, um, the things that uh, we think happened as, as a result of that with uh, some of these DNA CPR decisions. We did find evidence of unacceptable and inappropriate DNA CPRs being made um, at the start of the pandemic. Through our next part of the review, we are trying to establish how significant the scale of that problem is. Um, and that's work we're undertaking at the moment. Lots of the different agencies across the system did um, put out uh, lots of responses quite early on to try and um, highlight this as an issue and to try and um, signal to people about best practice. Um, there's differing review differing views since that time as to how much it remains a problem. From what I'm hearing, there still are some problems around. Uh, it's been very powerful to hear people's different experiences today. And we want to continue to hear from people using services about their experiences. And we have a Give Feedback on Care platform at the CQC, um, which people can feed through their experiences. And we we follow all of those up um, with, the, with the different teams across the country. We think there is still likely to be some inappropriate DNA CPRs in place. And we have a, uh, 
expressly um, asked all health and care providers, um, and that's hospitals, care homes, mental health providers, GPs, to make sure that they have reviewed their arrangements and they are confident that none of these inappropriate uh, DNA CPRs are in place. We are continuing to test that throughout the review. Um, and we do expect all providers and local systems to ensure that um, these discussions happen as part of the, the person-centred approach and as part of an individual approach in line with legal requirements. We also think it's really important that um, systems work together. A lot of the questions I've seen on the chat, uh, the, the question box, you know, it's really important that hospitals work with ambulance services, that um, care homes work with hospitals, and those, those, that information is shared in a way so everyone understands uh, what the person's wishes are and everyone understands what is appropriate. So we're now undertaking our field work. We, we're in seven different areas in the country. We're looking at a lot of the na national data. We're doing things like looking, tracking people's individual experiences and working with the health professionals that were involved in those decisions. And we're, we're sampling a whole range of DNA CPR uh, decisions um, to see what the quality of those are. So that should give us some really rich information. Um, I think uh, this, this is an important review. I'm, uh, I'm really grateful to all of the organizations like Compassion in Dying who've been working with us on this review. And I'm keen that we continue to work with organizations when we've released the report in March to really look at how we can improve care for people at the end of their life. And, and I, I, I'm a GP, I've had many of these decision discussions over the years. I don't think this should be confined to people at the end of their life. I think people, um, at any stage should be encouraged to have the, the discussion about what, the, what their wishes are, how they feel informed about the care that they receive, how we really make sure that all decisions are shared decisions um, and how we really make sure that we um, enable people to have really good quality decisions to make sure that their wishes are met. Thank you. I think Barbara's just disappeared there. So I'll take over for a moment. Thank you so much, Rosie. And thanks to um, everyone for those amazing contributions. Um, I will, to start us off in terms of questions, um, there's a question that's come in that I'll direct to Rosie first, because I know that um, you may have to leave a little bit earlier than others due to other commitments. So this question is about um, ensuring that we hear from a range of voices, um, including black and minority ethnic voices. So we've heard, the question is, we've heard um, some great contributions from um, speakers already in terms of thinking about health inequalities, and it's really heartening to hear of the work that the CQC are doing on the DNA CPR review. But could you talk a little bit about what you've done at the CQC to in, in, ensure that black and minority ethnic voices um, are being included as part of the review? Yes, absolutely. And some health inequalities are something that is very, very important to us. I think we're all concerned about the impact of the pandemic on widening inequalities and and we're all very aware of the disproportionate impact that this virus has had on, on some communities and particularly the Black and Asian um, minority ethnic communities. So it is something that's very important. Um, as part, um, we are particularly focusing on the review on, on two groups, which is the over 65s and people with learning disabilities, but we're not exclusively focusing on those. But as part of the questions that we ask at um, a local um, system level, so we're having lots of interviews with people who are in, uh, involved in leading the, um, the local area response. So that includes local authorities, it includes the commissioners of health, it includes um, all of the kind of leaders of the acute trusts and various other the acute hospitals and various other members of the leadership team. And those are the type of questions we're asking in those conversations to say, what are you doing to make sure that all, all of your population needs are met? And how do you identify the populations who may be more at risk and how are you looking at making sure that the, the health and care that you're delivering 
offering is absolutely um, appropriate to meet their needs. And that um, is particularly having a focus um, on the, the Black and Asian and minority ethnic populations. So that is something we're looking at. We're also making sure that the areas, the seven different areas of the country that we're looking at have a very broad demographic mix. So a different group of populations and uh, represent both people living in towns, people living in more rural areas, people where there's a higher proportion of um, uh, black and minority ethnic populations, uh, people uh, where there's a different types of services so we we've tried to pick the areas so it gives us a really good view across the country of what's happening and also when we are deep diving into those uh, people's records we're making sure that we get a good mix of of um of of the population there as well so it's it's truly representative of of what people are experiencing across the country thank you um, I've got a really interesting question here that I'm going to open out to everyone. Um, maybe if we could go to Sonia first, and then Peter, then Samira, and then Liz. Do the panellists believe it's appropriate for family members to raise the question to clinicians about how a person would like to die? Or do you think the conversation should be led and started by the person themselves? I think, uh, I think a bit of combination of both. I don't I don't know if individuals or even family members would have the kind of confidence to ask that of a clinician. I think we're still very much of a mindset that we take our lead from clinicians and we expect because they are the people with the expertise and the training that they will guide us. So yeah, I think it has to be a wee bit of both. Thanks. Can I go to um, Peter next? <clears throat> yes, certainly. No, I'd be very happy for anyone to speak to my family. We, we generally have open conversations about these things. So if it would be helpful for the clinician to speak to my family, then happy for them to go ahead. I, I would like to be informed, of course, what was discussed. But obviously, if anyone wants to discuss and get recommendations, I'd be very happy to go along with that. Thanks, Peter. Um, Samira, I'm interested to hear your um, experience from talking to people about the role of um, family members. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, so I so I think uh, there is something about uh, 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 amongst a lot of communities is that there is family and community and individuals. So there's the I within the we, I suppose, in a lot of communities. So it is about actually kind of the collective decision. I think there is something about uh, having that conversation to what extent you are enabled to have that conversation, to what extent you are aware that inf that uh, conversation actually exists. So I think this is the, 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 the challenge in terms of having that conversation um, requires a whole level of work with the community of connecting understanding the expectations, understanding the experience long before that takes place in the hospital, long before that conversation happens. So I think unless we as, a, as organizations, as a, as a hospital or as a, a health center, as a community are truly connected and own the system and feel confident that we are part of the system, it's really difficult to have that conversation uh, about uh, uh, what happens, what now and what next and who should be having that conversation. Thank you. Rosie, you... Did you so want to add? I, I just wanted to add, it's an interesting question about the, the, the relatives and, you know, I think Sonia's story was very powerful earlier. I think, I think we need to, if people have the capacity to have these discussions, then in, it's absolutely ideal for, in, for, for those discussions to happen with the relatives, I think, and with the, the people, the loved people's loved ones. However, sometimes in my experience as a GP, some people want to have that discussion on their own and not necessarily involve their relatives. And I think this is where we need to be, uh, we can encourage people to have that conversation with their relatives and bring them in. But I think we do need, if we are going to be truly personalized care planning, we need to be listening to what the person has to say and we need to be um, following their wishes. And so I think um, it is absolutely where we would love to get to in terms of those discussions being had more broadly, but sometimes due to individual circumstances, that's not always um, 
appropriate for them or, or the right thing. So, um, so I think we do need to, again, have that very personalised approach. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the, I've got a question again for you, Rosie. This is from Alison. So many people are ageing alone and um, Alison is part of an advocacy service that supports them and helps them to make advanced care plans and plan for the end of their lives. So many of Alison's clients go on to develop cognitive impairments and she's aware that there's a blanket assumption that anyone with a cognitive impairment is unable to give any indication about the care and treatment they would like to have. So her question is, how is the CQC ensuring that people ageing alone, living with dementia, are appropriately and independently supported to make decisions? Yes, and this is where it's really important that um, anyone having these discussions um, has the appropriate training and support to be able to make uh, these decisions well and to support people to make the decisions. Um, capacity is something that fluctuates so uh, we shouldn't automatically assume that people with dementia don't have capacity to make the decisions. We need to be um, uh, assessing people's capacity as we're making those decisions and, and to make those good decisions. This is where um, there, there are support and help for people if they're unsure what to do and, and um, to, uh, to seek access to that help to make sure Sure that the right uh, right decisions are made for that person and um, in conjunction ideally with relatives again and uh, and people are caring for that person I think in an ideal world um, we ought to be having those conversations much earlier we ought to as a society be having those conversations much earlier so that actually uh, we know what people's um, wishes are before um, before they get to the stage where they're not able to have those discussions. I know that's not always possible, but I think uh, I think several speakers have talked about the importance of early discussions. And my view is let's try and get those discussions starting at a, a really early stage. So before people are poorly, before people have um, you know lost their memory or not able to have those discussions. So we really understand people's wishes. Thanks. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And certainly from sort of our experience of supporting people through our services at Compassion in Dying is that the earlier you can bring those conversations and those discussions, um, then the, the, the better the quality of those discussions are as well. And I think Peter's experience really highlighted this, that when you actually can approach a, a situation which might normally be viewed as a crisis situation, having already perhaps thought through what's important to you, then it makes those situations much um, clearer and much calmer. Um, so I've got a great question here, which um, I think could go out to most people, um, which is um, these solutions that have been floated have been great to listen to, but I'm not a doctor or a politician. So what can I do as a member of the public to make sure that they happen? So I'll go to Liz first with that one. I think the first thing you can do is talk to your family about your own wishes and make sure they've done theirs and then get that to spread and talk to all your friends and everyone you know to say, have you got this done? Because you never know what's going to happen. Word of mouth through the general public is often a great way of causing change. Um, Twitter, Instagram, social media are often great, but you can do it yourself through your community, through your village. Just make sure that everyone you know talks about how they want to die, what their plans are and get them to tell their friends. And then you go and tell your GP, I want this on my record. This is what my plan is. It's amazing how quickly an underground movement can suddenly make politicians and healthcare leaders realize we need to do something about this because the public are demanding it. Thanks, Samira, what, what would you add? Uh, yeah, so I think, um, so I, there is something about, um, uh, faith and the role and the perspective of living and dying and actually um, um, so I, I sometimes I do struggle with the whole personalization agenda and actually wanting to because um, to what extent it connects with our community especially with our uh, black Asian minority ethnic communities um, because we, we we're not it's not that we're not thinking that far ahead it's just that the challenges that exist within your living day day to day. So the kind of priorities that overtake the reality of, uh, of uh, uh, actually kind of making decisions. 
So how we manage those conversations in our community and across is sometimes can be really difficult. Uh, and that's the reality. We've had lots of people who have actually passed away in hospital and died alone and having no family other than community. Uh, so who do you have that conversation with? And to what extent um, there is the space to have those conversations we, when you have so many host of other challenges. You're living in overcrowded accommodation. You have employment issues. You're 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 on lowing all of those things. So sometimes I do struggle with answering the question about both about having the uh, making these choices, but also having the uh, the space to actually kind of make plans around end of life. And uh, so I, I'll just stop there. Thank you. Um, I and I personally would add as well on the what can you do um, as a you know not as a doctor or as a politician to try and um, influence change. So just thinking in terms of um, my point that I made around ensuring a balanced narrative, I think that what, what people can definitely do is if you're seeing something consistently reflected in the media that you don't feel like reflects your reality, whatever that may be, then talk to your doctor about, about, your, uh, about what your reality is. And, and also talk to organisations like Compassion in Dying, because I think one of the things that came through really clearly in everybody's talks is the power of personal stories and the power of uh, those messages of the impact on real people um, to achieve change. So you can share those stories if you feel comfortable doing it. And you can also write to media outlets, write, write in letters and explain that, um, explain you know what's happened to you and, and how that's impacted you. And, and, and people do read those things. So that would be really helpful. Um, Sonia, what would you add in terms of things that we can all do to help change? Training. Training, well, from, from my our perspective, it would need, to, I, I don't know if maybe Alan's case was very unique in that we weren't told about the terminal diagnosis and, you know, that seemed to be the journey, his journey right through from, you know, his diagnosis. I don't know if healthcare professionals are trained in how to have that conversation. So as an individual, can we put pressure on MPs, MSPs, you know, for that to happen so that there is a kind of an open door if you want to have that conversation? Thank you. So my next question is for Liz. Um, so this person says, having watched my mum die after a slow decline with various health problems, it seems to me that one of the barriers to people feeling in charge is benign paternalism. So doctors can be unwilling to allow people to make their own decisions if they are at odds with what seems sensible. But whose responsibility is it to instill these values so that medical culture moves rapidly away from paternalism? And what practical steps can be taken to achieve this? Well, that's a big issue to take. And I think one of the problems is doctors are people and have their own personalities and beliefs and prejudices and biases and some doctors and nurses are excellent at having these conversations and do it on a daily basis and others can have all the training in the world and they're just never going to be good or never going to feel comfortable. I think starting at a medical school level and telling junior doctors and nurses how to talk about dying, that dying is normal, telling them what a normal death in hospital can be like, how palliative care can help, explaining that and hearing from patients and their relatives to realize, to get both sides of the coin. I think it's much harder to persuade more established doctors to change their practice. Often they think they know it all and they wouldn't listen to something like this because they're not interested in it. But if we can start with the junior doctors and students to make them realize how important it is. It's also telling the general public that you have the right to say, this isn't what I want. I need you to listen to me. You have, it should be a mutual relationship. You should be on an equal power setting and telling the public you can, argue with your doctor, you can disagree with them, you can say, this is about me, it's not about what you think is best for me, and giving patients the ability to feel comfortable to do that. It is gonna take time, and I think it's just educating everybody to say, you all need to talk about death, but this is what's best for the patient, not what you think they should have or what you would like yourself. Thank you. Um, yeah, go on, Rosie, did you want to come in? 
Well, I was just going to say, I, I completely agree with Liz. And I think that actually we need to see this uh, education and training and support for people in all specialties and in all care settings. I think some, some specialties do this very well. So if you're maybe a, a, um, a geriatrician or if you're um, working in a hospice or in, in general practice, certainly we get uh, a lot of uh, training around uh, uh, supporting people to make shared decisions and um, thinking about personalised uh, care planning. But I think sometimes some of the other specialties, um, it's not considered as much. And certainly some of the things we've heard is in some care homes as well, some of the, the care staff uh, are not feeling equipped to be having those discussions as well. And so I think we do need to think about this right across um, all parts of the health and care system and make sure that everyone has that training. And we need to make sure that we hold um, the people who are running these providers, the, you know, the the boards of the hospitals, uh, the, the people who are leading the GP practices, we need to make sure that they are happy that people are able to have these discussions and have the training and support they need to be able to do that. So I think there's, there is a, a lot of work we need to do in this area. Some of it is very cultural and some of it will take a long time to change, but I think we do need to see how we can accelerate that as quickly as possible. Thanks. The next question um, is for you again, Rosie, um, and also for me. So I'll come to you first. Um, this is from Kate. How important do you think it is for people facing DNA CPR decisions to have access to independent information to help them understand, discuss and or challenge the decision? Um, I think it is really important for people to have information that they can use. I was struck by what Liz was saying about um, the, the information when someone is going to give birth and the huge array of information and access you have to, uh, to those resources and the support you have around that time. And we do need to make sure that people feel very equipped to a, be able to kind of start up these conversations, but to have the information that gives them the knowledge um, and the ability to understand uh, what their human rights are and uh, what the, the, the position is in, in lots of ways. And we need to make sure that that's accessible to everyone. You know, actually we need to make sure that it's it's available in different languages, that it's available for people who, who, who can't, um, can't read, um, it's available for people who don't have access to digital solutions all of those things so we need to make sure that everyone has that information um, and I think it gives people some um, it can give some people reassurance if they're getting that from an independent source um, I know a lot of the media has been rather negative recently about DNA CPR and and you know there is that uh, lots of lots of um, people absolutely have that trust with their clinicians, which is fantastic, but some people don't have that kind of trusting relationship with their clinicians. And so it is important that they can get that information from an independent source to enable them to make uh, the decision that's right for them. Thanks. And um, yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. I, I think as well, just to add to that, in terms of the volume of calls that we take about um, CPR decisions, as well as it being hugely important for individuals to have those trusted independent sources of information, really important for healthcare professionals as well. So a lot of the calls we take are from doctors saying, oh, my, my patient's asked for a DNA CPR, where do I get one? Or, um, you know, someone from a care home saying, this person's moving care settings, what do I do? And there's a lot of uh, confusion um, amongst the healthcare professional community as well in terms of how these things work. So I think we've got a really long way to go in terms of um, kind of simplifying information and making it accessible and understandable to people and, th and that um, empowering people to be able to take the decisions that they want to do as Rosie said. Um, so the next question I have is for Peter. Um, and I don't know who this is from, but it's a great question. They, they've said, I've been procrastinating about making a living will for about a year now. You seem so resolute and calm in your decisions. What advice would you give me to help consider what I might want or not want when I'm near the end of life? I think the first thing to remember is that most people will have seen the rather unpleasant scenes from hospital 
on our news every night, they can see how people are passing away and so on. And therefore it's um, <clears throat> things that should perhaps be discussed between friends to start with. Have you seen the films last night, etc.? What do you feel about talking to somebody? What do you feel about the DNR? What do you feel about having an extended life with, uh, with, with all the horrors that go with, with extending it? I, I think it um, would be good for friends to discuss amongst themselves if they, if they have any fear. But in general, I, I was thinking that not enough people are, are signing up for DNRs and, and CPRs that this is something which should also go to solicitors, that as people write their wills, they should perhaps, solicitors should perhaps discuss this sort of question with them, because it's all part and parcel of the same thing. So, is that okay? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. I think you've hit on a really interesting point there about trigger points um, and touch points at various people's lives, and that, and that plays really nicely into Rosie's point earlier about how um, you know, thinking about what we can do to bring these conversations earlier than when somebody's already at the end of life. Thank you. Um, just to say that Barbara's still experiencing um, technical difficulty, so I'm not hogging the chairing. I'm going to hand over to her for the conclusion um, <laughs> shortly before the end. So the next question that I have is for Samira. What do you think is the most urgent change that health system leaders need to implement in order to tackle the inequalities experienced by black and minority ethnic communities? Um, so, so I think um, it's just the, how we connect with people, how we, connect, how we use the data. We already have the data. There's nothing that the data can tell us that we don't already know and we haven't known. We had the Marmot review 10 years ago and we've got Marmot 2020 that tells us exactly uh, the same, if not more. We had the Kevin Fenton report around the disproportionate impact and the fact that, you know, um, um, COVID uh, shone a light on the inequality. So these inequalities that exist in our communities are not are nothing new. The solutions that have been put forward uh, a long time ago are not new. I think the idea is that how do we begin to have honest conversations with our communities about the reality of what needs to happen, what needs to change. I think our communities are doing a huge amount of work. I mean, if you look at how they were mobilized to support our hospitals, our, you know, our, everyone in the system around COVID, uh, you know, they, you had the, you know, you had the, the Sikh temples, um, you know, making thousands of lunches for the hospitals. You had the community centers actually kind of supporting people. I think the idea is not, this isn't about something that we as a system need to fix and what can we do? I think the idea is that how we connect with our communities in a different way through the power of conversations, through what matters to them, through their lens, through their stories, not through our system's lens, because I don't think the change really is going to come from our system. I think the change is going to come from our communities. We just need to, um, in a way, get out of the way sometimes and let our communities actually kind of enable us to make the change that... Um, uh, that really needs to take place in the system. So the solutions are out there, the evidence is out there, we just need to begin to act on it. Thanks, Samira. I'm uh, detecting a, um, uh, an element of frustration there, I'm sure, from you know all these conversations and policy reports happening time and time again. I think, you know, frustration is a great motivator. So I have no, uh, I think every uh, pro project, every program, every activity that I've ever done has been born out frustration. Is that how we use it? Uh, with positive intent, how we use it with compassion and how we work together to actually kind of deliver the change. So this is um, uh, about how we mobilize communities and mobilize ourselves to change. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I have a question here for everyone. Um, many of the people watching have asked different versions of the same question. So both people who are doctors and people um, who have experience of being a patient or a carer. So how do we change culture and education so that everybody understands more about death? How do we explode the myth that talking about uh, the end of life um, might take away hope when actually research shows the opposite? Um, uh, and what can we do to make um, caring professionals or, or to help them avoid raising the topic of end of life um, or not responding to cues as in um, Alan and Sonia's story. So Sonia, I'll, I'll come to you first with that one, if I may. I think we all, we, we need, I know I've already, I've said that we need training for healthcare professionals, 
But I also think the public needs to be empowered because we still hold doctors in revere. We, st we still do so. And we rely on their, their knowledge, their expertise, and we take our leads from them. And I think if we felt more empowered, we may feel able to have those conversations. But they certainly haven't happened before now. But I, I definitely feel if we can empower the public and we can, you know, there can be training for healthcare professionals somewhere in the middle, you know, we could you we could meet. It starts as a conversation through the education system, hopefully, and continues from there. We teach a lot of things in school now, in schools now, but do we teach anything about end of life? We teach, you know, pregnancy, childbirth, you know, biology. But do we could we factor that in somewhere? I certainly know with in Alan's case, there were so many times I had left the door open for someone to tell me that it was terminal, and no one. In particular, I had asked the lung cancer nurse if a DS-1500 was appropriate for Alan, a DS-1500 being the document that you use to claim benefits quickly. It certifies that you're terminally ill. And I work in the Citizens Advice Bureau, so I know what that document means. So I had left that door open and I had very specifically asked if that document was appropriate because I would know what it, would, what it meant, but Alan wouldn't. And they told me it wasn't appropriate. So once again, the door was closed. There wasn't any other conversation as to, you know, you could, you know, just be aware that A, B and C. So I think let's tag it on somewhere within the education system and also educate our healthcare professionals. Because I know when Alan was first admitted, we were put in this wee side room and there was a, a, a booklet in the room in a folder. With the, so it's like a, an A4 plastic fools cap folder and this folk, but you know, I'm nosy, I, I would go and have a look. And it was a, a, a booklet called Coping with Crisis. And the booklet in a kind of roundabout way was, you know, telling people about the decisions they could make at end of life, but it wasn't very specifically saying that. If you looked at the front, Coping Crisis could mean anything. So, the, you know, the, the needs to, that conversation needs to be drawn out, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Liz, can I bring you in just thinking about culture change and... Um, yeah, I it? think thinking outside the box, we need to get younger people talking about it. And I think that could be where you use influencers, people who have a voice that people listen to. Take the whole COVID vaccination programme and one person, one celebrity says, I don't believe in it. You get a load of people believing them. The whole fake news that happens. If we can get influencers to start talking about it, to encourage teenagers, young people to think, oh, death is normal. This is what happens. My mum died and it was fine. And using that as a way of getting the younger generations to start talking about it and asking questions, then they can ask their parents. What do you want to happen to you? Where do you want to be buried? Do you want to be resuscitated? And maybe that might be a way of making it a more common conversation. Thanks, Rosie. Well, I, I was just going to add to that because I think there's been some really interesting things in the questions that have come up. And I don't think there's probably one single answer to that question. I think that we have to look at how we approach this in a whole range of different methods, whether it's looking at education, whether it's using soaps, as someone suggested, whether it's, you know, in television channels, whether it's using religious lead leaders to help with those messages. Um, I think we need to be thinking really broadly about how we um, both look at embedding this. There's some opportunities, I think, as, as health and care providers are, are working together to really look at how we embed good end of life care and good uh, personalised care planning into local health and care systems. But I think we need to be thinking really broadly and really creatively to change that. You know, it is it does need a social movement change. It does need that kind of societal change. And that's going to take time, but it's going to take a whole range of different approaches. Thanks, Peter. Well, I think this is a question that needs a really new new approach. I mean, education is the word that, that counts. The points always made, you talk to your clinician, you discuss with your doctor and so on, but how often can most people get to their doctors and have a 15 or 20 minute discussion? It's not something you can brush away in a couple of minutes. How would you like to pass away your end of life? So I think one needs to think ahead of talking to doctors, your, your own GP, and, and 
get it into education in some form or other. I don't know how you can do that. I mean, you can work with solicitors, you can work with local education, you can do all sorts of things, but I think we should not rely on, on patients going to talk to the doctors about this. Yeah, yeah. You do need more than two, you do need more than two or three minutes because when you get into it, you might say, oh gosh, I, I really don't want to talk about it now or something like that. So education. Yes, Somebody thank you. Mind. And it's a really interesting point. It actually came up in our very first webinar in this series. It was something that um, Dr. Catherine Mannix raised with the um, possibility and the importance of getting into education much earlier, not just being about educating doctors. So, yeah. Um, and Samira. Yeah, so so I think, um, I mean, we all know culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch and dinner. So how do you change the culture? No amount of training or um, what well, one thing that uh, we're doing. Uh, so we have imperial uh, medical students. And the idea is that there is kind of a program, a, a partnership with local communities where they're working on community, uh, community action projects where they're placed in GP surgeries or at the hospital, but also placed in community. And what's really interesting, actually kind of working with the community during the COVID, it really highlighted, it changed the way the thinking with the medical students coming in purely from saying, I'm here to, to learn about the, the practical elements of medicine and science. I'm not here to learn about community and the interaction with community through that period and actually kind of working with them through by developing some, some uh, videos uh, uh, from community perspective change the dynamics and the feedback from the students was just transformational in that way. So I wonder in how we are, and R.T. Maney, who's one of the medical leads at, uh, you know, at uh, Imperial Medical School, is leading on this amazing program where you're actually kind of starting with young medical students to learn about this. Um, I think we have an opportunity now with COVID and the disproportionate impact on, in terms of deaths in families in communities and in wider society is how we begin. We have an opportunity while people are still of an open heart and an open mind to have a conversation about the death and dying and actually kind of uh, uh, what that means for, for, for people and how we can have these open and honest conversations. So I really think we need to capitalize on that at the moment. Yeah, thank you. I completely agree. I think um, we did some really interesting research um, a year or so ago, which showed, which really kind of busted apart that myth about death being a taboo. And it showed that by far the majority of people were really happy to have conversations about the end of life, but only a small proportion felt comfortable instigating those conversations. So you're left with this ridiculous situation where people say death is a taboo, but actually pe people people just want an opening and and that's certainly what we find is that people just want an opportunity to, to talk about these things so i'll hand over to barbara now thanks barbara and thanks everybody for that great session uh thank you usha um i'm hoping everyone can hear me um and maybe see me even um and my apologies um first of all for um serious internet problems and my patch means that although i've been able to hear this very rich conversation um i wasn't able to see the questions so huge thanks um to usha for seamlessly and effortlessly um sharing as well as answering questions and a big thank you to all our speakers this afternoon, who I think have given really valuable and, and different and rich insights um, into the problems uh, facing dying people. I think we pretty much know what needs to happen to improve end of life care. This is the last in a series of webinars um, where we've heard from a wide range of experts and I just wanted to um, reprise um, some of the things um, that they've talked about. In the first webinar, we agreed uh, that coronavirus has created a watershed moment to rethink how we talk about death and dying. Patient advocate Molly Bartlett urged healthcare professionals to have honest conversations with their patients about diagnoses and treatments as well as conversations about DNA CPR. Dr. Anushka Oberlach and Sean Linton highlighted the need for more training for healthcare professionals, and that's come up again, of course, today, so that they're readier to talk about death and dying. Dr. Catherine Mannix told us, and I think this is really important, and I think Rosie was talking about it too, that we need to gather good 
practice examples, as well as thinking about when it goes wrong, so that we really can see what good end of life care looks like. I also raise the point that the Royal Medical Colleges should take a lead on culture change to make the patient's voice paramount. The second webinar focused on CPR and do not resuscitate decisions and campaigner Kate Masters warned us of the huge cost of getting these things wrong. Kate suggested that the language around CPR needs to be simplified so that both patients and clinicians understand its benefits and limitations. The involvement of nurses, I think, might be key here. They're well placed to have these conversations. We heard that we need to learn from our mistakes, particularly the distress that poor communication causes for individuals and families. And Dr. Mark Talbot and Dr. Zoe Fritz emphasise the importance, again, of honest, clear conversations. Our third webinar considered the effects of race, gender, learning, disability, sexuality, and social determinants on how people die. The panelists, Tor Butler Cole, Rebecca Manson Jones, and Dallas Pans, told us all how these factors contribute and interact um, to people having worse end of life experiences. And they urged policymakers to examine and address how the factors intersect with one another in ways that result in people not having a death uh, that's based on what's important to them personally. Everyone, I firmly think, in health and social care should step back and examine who we're not reaching and what we can do to address that um, in a way, as we've heard today, that really listens to the solutions that individuals themselves and communities can give us. I hope that system leaders and policy makers who are listening to this webinar today will take on board what's been shared and incorporate the solutions discussed into their work to effect meaningful change. I hope that system leaders and policy makers will always involve and listen to dying people. It's the collaborative approach to decision making that ensures that dying people and their families get the deaths that are right for them as individuals. There's a lot of work to be done, but as ever, there's a huge offer of help here. I'd love to hear from organizations and members of the public who want to work together on this. And policymakers, I urge you to take up the offers. Let's do something about all this. Let's make a difference now. Rosie uh, mentioned uh, social movement. Um, let's start that social movement. I want to thank you all uh, for your time and your contributions. Um, and in what is now time-honoured fashion uh, to stay, stay safe. Thank you very much, everybody.